Terry Smith, also known as the English Warren Buffett, can teach us a lot about investing. So let's explore the five main points that he believes are the most important in investing. Let's learn how to think about investing, how to find great companies and how to avoid losers. And as a bonus at the end of the video, Terry Smith will also show us how he applies these principles in real life situations. But if we are going to learn, we should make sure we can really trust the teacher. Well, Terry Smith started his fund in 2010 and since then his rate of return has been an incredible 14.8% per year. That is over 504% since inception. So he may know a thing or two about investing. Okay, so let's start with his first timeless lesson. I apologize for, uh, for what I'm about to say next if you're not in the financial because it sounds blindingly obvious, because it is, but the vast majority of fund managers do not do it. We seek to buy very good companies. And people, and the reason I say that is when I've said that over time to people who are not in financial services, uh, and they say, well, well, don't all fund managers buy good companies? No, I was a broker for many years. In my experience, they'll buy all kinds of rubbish. Uh, they'll buy it because it's going to get better, because it's going to be taken over, because the management's going to change, because the cycle's going to change, because somebody bought them lunch, told them a funny story. We don't do that. Now, there are a few people out there who can make money buying bad companies and getting it right when things change, but frankly, they're a very small minority. And equally, frankly, I really don't want to sit there with a bad company while I'm waiting for things to get better. I want something that adds a small, predictable, incremental amount of extra value to what we own every single day of its life, predictably. Buying great companies makes the whole investing process so much simpler. It is just easier not to worry about external factors, market cycles, changes in the management and so on, but instead just choose companies that may be boring, but which have a long history of delivering predictable results quarter after quarter and year after year. Okay, so let's get to the second point. Now I did, in the, in the course of being a broker, encounter a few fund managers who did actually go out and buy good companies. And they'd say, well, there's my portfolio, what do you think? And I go, well, they're all very good companies. They, they would qualify on what I would call a good company, yes. And they'd say, well, why do you think I keep underperforming? I said, well, it's pretty simple. You overpaid. So the other thing we've got to do is not overpay. We have to have undiscipline about what we're prepared to pay. Even the very best companies have a price that we cannot possibly pay for them. We have seen many times in the history that thinking that there is no such thing as a price too high may lead to terrible disasters like the Nifty 50, dot-com bubble or 2008 housing crisis. All of them occurred because more and more people believed that a certain asset will always go up in value and therefore there is no such thing as a price too high. So what should we do when we buy a great company at a fair price? The most important thing we're going to do with this fund, other than identifying and buying good companies and not overpaying for them, is and this is the most difficult part of it, okay? We're going to do nothing. That's the really difficult bit. Once we've found a good company and we've bought it at a good price, we're going to sit on our hands and endeavour not to deal in it. And the reason we do that is several fold. The main one is every time you deal, you incur costs. You incur commissions. In the UK, you incur stamp duty and you incur bid offer spreads. We don't do that for that reason. We also don't do that reason is because there are very, very, very few companies that fit our criteria. And changing one is dangerous, basically. Uh, finding another one is incredibly difficult. Doing nothing after we invested in a great company at a fair price is crucial because it allows compounding to do its magic. If we just let it slowly gain momentum and not interfere with the process, we have a decent chance of making such investment work. Okay, so these three rules make total sense. Buy great companies, don't overpay, and do nothing. But how can we find a great company? There are lots of parts of the market that we simply will not own. Um, it means that we 
have a limited number of things that we have to think about. That's good, because actually there's a limited number of things we're capable of thinking about. And the good news is at least we've managed to identify that, whereas a lot of people haven't managed to figure out that they, you know, they're capable of thinking about very few things. We'll never own a bank. We'll never own an insurance company. We'll never own a real estate company. We won't own anything that's heavily cyclical, like engineering uh, or chemicals or, or um, uh, steel, for example. We won't own any utilities. We won't own any resources. And the one thing we will never, ever own, no matter whatever happens, is an airline. And <laughs> so we should start looking for a great company by limiting our options. Warren Buffett calls it his circle of competence. We have to define our own circle, invest only in companies we understand that have certain characteristics that we find attractive and easy to understand, and avoid, or at least try to avoid, companies with a lot of moving parts, with a lot of unpredictability. Okay, so we know what not to buy, but what should we buy? What we like is really old line technology, stuff that doesn't change much. We like investing in elevator companies. Mr. Otis patented the safety elevator in about 1850. It hasn't changed since. It's the same design. Uh, we like investing in shaving businesses. Mr. Gillette patented the safety razor in about 1908. It hasn't changed significantly. Uh, if any of you go to India, you'll find that the safety razor, the original one where you twiddle the shaft and the jaws open, you drop a blade in, is still Gillette's biggest selling product in India. Um, that's the sort of technology we like. When we're describing it, we come down to describe it by the words small ticket, consumer, non-durable. Small ticket, things that we all buy, and we buy them by doing this. It's not a life-changing experience. We don't need to raise a mortgage or use a credit card. Just take one of these out and buy it. It's, you don't think about it very much. Just go and buy it. Small ticket, consumer, it's sold to us, the consumer. Uh, we don't like things on the whole that are sold to other companies, if we can avoid them. Why? Companies employ terrible people called purchasing managers. Purchasing managers' job is to negotiate on price, then to negotiate on payment terms, then to find a reason to renege and come back and get another discount. Right? Any of you dealt with them all or have been purchasing managers will know. You, the consumer, have no opportunity to negotiate on price. If you think you do, next time you go in and you're buying your, your cosmetics or your deodorants and toiletries or your household cleaning products or your snacks, have a go at negotiating on price. Let us know how you get on. I think you'll come out empty-handed. So small to consumer, non-durables. We don't like companies that make durable items. If you've got a durable item like a car and you're feeling a bit hard up, just have it serviced. It will be here next year, probably. Um, whereas with the things that we buy, once you've consumed it, you want some more, you have to go buy some more. So we're looking at companies that basically do our everyday necessities and luxuries. Uh, people who, if you, you ask us to define a single characteristic of these companies, they make their money out of a large number of everyday predictable events, basically. Predictability, reoccurring revenue, simplicity, and a power of brands. Such things create a durable competitive advantage. That is something that Warren Buffett calls a moat. We may define great companies differently, but I have to say that Terry Smith's approach is so simple and elegant that it is very appealing. So if you want to clone Terry Smith's investment philosophy, you know what to avoid, what to look for, and how to act when you find it. And now let's see an example of a company that is a perfect fit for such an investment philosophy. One of the things that we really like to invest in, for example, is toothpaste. Okay? So we're going to have a little go at toothpaste, I think, as an audience. Could I ask you all to put your hand up? Would you mind all just putting your hand in the air? Would you do that for me? Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you to put your hand down if I name your brand. So I'm going to Oral-B. Put your hand down if you use Oral-B to brush your teeth. Crest, Signal, Pepsodent, no? Colgate, okay. <laughs> we got you covered. <laughs> Ultra bright, I could fling in a few others. You get my drift. Uh, just one example of a company. We own Colgate. It's 206 years old. The average company in our portfolio was founded in 1892. They survived the Great War, the Second World War, and the Great Depression. They'll probably survive whatever comes next. Probably. Yeah? How much you think? Um, Colgate is the number one worldwide in toothpaste and toothbrushes. It operates with 60% gross margins. Uh, to put that in English, it makes it for two and sells it for five. 
it gives you an awful lot of capability to deal with the odd bump in the road when you've got those kind of uh, characteristics. As a result, it makes over 50% return on capital employed in cash. It converts last year 113% of profits into cash. We like cash. It's the only thing they can pay us a dividend in. So we really like it. And the really good bit is there's a path to growth. Two-thirds of the world doesn't use toothpaste, but they will. You know? As people become more prosperous, it's a key thing that people will do. So that's an just an example of the sort of company that we like. Just to check if such investment approach really makes sense, let's take a look at the numbers. Since this speech in 2012, the stock of Colgate Palmolive went up by 63.8% and the dividends generated another 40.7% over that time period. And that is without reinvesting the dividends. So not a bad result for a boring, predictable business which was created when Thomas Jefferson was the president. And I really believe that Terry Smith's investing philosophy is just as relevant today as it was in 2012. We may agree with Terry Smith or we may not, but he sticks to his main rules through the years and his results are exceptional. And of course, we always have to find the right investment strategy for us, the one that fits our character and our goals. But buying great companies, not overpaying and doing nothing seems like an interesting way to go. If you enjoyed this video, you may want to check out my other video about five not so easy steps to financial independence by clicking over here. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next one.